Well, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are here today to talk about the latest uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, including uh, very excitingly, I think, uh, vaccines for children, uh, updates on variants, um, and what we need to know as we head into the winter. I wanna first thank the Stavros Miracles Foundation for their critical support of our education and outreach programming um, that allows us to host these events. I am now delighted to introduce and welcome back Dr. Deepta Bhattacharya, an esteemed Nisif Robertson investigator alum, expert immunologist and associate professor of immuno immunobiology and surgery at the University of Arizona. Uh, Deepta studies vaccines, antibody responses, and how the body fights off infections using these incredible tools um, that we have uh, in our bodies and now uh, the tools of modern science. So uh, Deepta is a longtime member of our NICEF innovator community and uh, really the perfect person to address all of the questions that we all have about the vaccines, what the world may look like this winter, next year and beyond. So we are thrilled to have you here with us once again, Deepta, thank you very much. Thanks for having me again, Susan. I think, uh, you know, we were just talking a little bit beforehand that I was hoping that the world would be in a situation where people wouldn't care too much about what I had to say anymore. But uh, unfortunately, <laughs> here we are. But, you know, I think I think I still think that as we go forward, you know, there's going to be some notes of optimism. Well, you know, I, I want to start, uh, I think, with kind of a lay of the land. Um, and, you know, since we have uh, since we last spoke, uh, we've seen COVID cases uh, decreasing um, from, well, we saw them decrease, then we saw them increase. Uh, they seem to be decreasing from the recent peak, uh, depending on where you live, um, but they've plateaued over the last few weeks. So what can you tell us about the status of the COVID-19 pandemic as it currently stands? Let's just stick with the U.S. for now. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, I think this is what we're going to be looking at for a little bit of time going forward here is basically these spikes and these valleys and these spikes and these valleys. But what should happen is that the magnitude of those spikes should start to decrease as people get immunity one way or the other. Obviously, the preferred way is to get it through vaccination. Um, but, you know, what eventually is going to happen is that Delta is going to find people who are who don't have immunity yet. Um, and I think We've probably heard and seen some of these headlines from the New York Times uh, saying that herd immunity is impossible. What that basically means is that Delta will find a way to you if you don't have immunity. There's no indirect protection here. So, I, you know, I was really hoping the last time we talked, I, you know, this was pre-Delta, and I really, really thought that we were looking to were really the horizon was in sight. Um, but then Delta came, and I think many of us who work on virology and immunology were really taken aback at just how transmissible it was. And so because of that, I think, you know, it's prolonging things a little bit, but, you know, it, it will come to an end, um, or at least uh, certainly won't be in this form anytime for, for that much longer. Um, but, you know, it's sort of up to us as to how quickly we can actually get there. Well, I think, um, you know, this Delta variant uh, is, which was startling enough, um, there's now uh, this Delta variant being called uh, Delta Plus, um, is that something that we need to be concerned about or uh, will the combination of the vaccines and uh, these new pills uh, help uh, protect us against this uh, variant uh, as well? Yeah, um, we and, and we talked about this a little bit last time too. And again, I think we're still in a place where the most problematic property of the virus is how transmissible it is or it isn't. Um, and so, you know, the, the original versions of COVID, um, the COVID classic, I guess I'll call it, um, was, uh, you know, had a certain degree of transmissibility. Um, and then there have been subsequent variants that have emerged since then that uh, are much more transmissible, um, two to three times more transmissible. That's just sort of where we're at right now with Delta, which is why it's, it's been difficult to keep it under control. Um, I'm sure that there will be some variants coming forward. Um, but I think that I'm still in the camp that we sort of just need to wait and see. Every time we hear about a new variant, maybe we need to hang back just a little bit and see how it goes, because we've seen this before. There's actually a version of Delta called Delta Plus before. That's a different one than this Delta Plus. So I think that the nomenclature is a little bit hairy here. Um, but you know, that one I think people were worried about because it looked like it might pick up a mutation, might have picked up a mutation that would lead to some degree of immune escape from either infection or vaccine-induced immunity. 
But in the end, um, it actually um, cost the virus quite a bit in terms of a fitness cost. Um, and it just didn't replicate very well. It didn't infect people very well and it's gone. Um, so I, I think this is still, the, the goal here is that, you know, this is a virus, it, there will be new variants, it will change. Um, but what we really want to do is get to a point where we force the virus to make a choice. You know, either make a bunch of copies of itself really quickly and be really transmissible or evade the immune system and take a fitness cost. And we've seen that a couple of times, like a couple of mutations that looked like they were going to be a problem for immune escape ended up not being so because the virus sort of petered out. So, you know, I think we just need to wait and see. I mean, again, at some point, the virus will probably find some combination of things that will allow it to get past a little bit. Um, but I don't anticipate a complete loss of immunity anytime soon. So um, can you talk about what we know about the immunity we have from uh, the COVID vaccines uh, months and even a year after vaccination, uh, you know, for, for, the, for the earliest, uh, you know, vaccine takers, uh, we're getting close to that. Um, and we know that these antibody levels go down, which is normal, but kind of what does this mean for our protection and kind of, um, uh, you know, the other uh, protections uh, that we're going to, to have. Um, and, you know, as uh, I, I read today um, that, uh, you know, someone was saying, we're seeing a lot of takers for, you know, boosters. Um, we need to see more takers for the first shot. Yeah. No, I mean, definitely. Um, uh, so, you know, last time, again, last time we talked, I think that, you know, we just got started to get some of the data from Pfizer and from Moderna. And both of them were remarkably efficacious, right? 94, 95% efficacious against COVID Classic. Um, so very clearly some things have slipped, though I do wanna make some categories, I guess, in terms of protection, right? There's the most important thing, which is how well are the vaccines and the immunity you get from those vaccines doing at uh, keeping you out of the hospital, keeping you from dying from the infection. Right. And in that regard, um, you know, unless you have some pre-existing condition, the vaccines are actually are holding pretty steady. So that's good. So the very most important thing, the vaccines are still doing fine. And we can go into the anatomy as to why it's a little bit easier to protect against severe disease versus any um, infection. Sure. Um, I think that would be interesting. Okay. Yeah. So we'll get into that in just a second here. But but I think um, you know what very clearly has happened is is we right now we're a little lower than that. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, and it's a little hard to disentangle. Um, I, in my opinion, if you really look at the data, I think the most important factor here is Delta. Um, and it's not really so much about immune escape, it's just that when someone gets infected with the Delta variant, it replicates so quickly and it generates so many more copies of itself um, that when someone who has it breathes or coughs, you're just exposed to a ton more virus than you were before. Viral load. Viral load, yeah, like infectious viruses. Um, and so what that then means is that you have to have more pre-existing antibodies to protect against it. It's not so much that the Delta has so many mutations that it's managed to squeak its way past. It's got a couple, but that's not the major problem with Delta. Um, so uh, that's, I think, the major issue. There are, There is, has been a little bit of waning um, in terms of um, you know, how much intrinsic immunity um, have we lost since we first got the vaccines? And I think at the beginning, people were assuming that it was a lot. Um, I've always been pretty skeptical of that if you really look at the data. So I'll, just a couple of little points here. Um, as you say, antibodies decline, um, but but that's, an, that's a normal part of the immune response, as you said. And um, basically what happens is that after you get infected or vaccinated, you get the, you generate this huge bolus of antibodies early in the response. Um, but the antibodies that are being made aren't that great. Um, and so, you know, first of all, what are antibodies? They're proteins that are supposed to stick to the virus and keep it from infecting cells. That's what, that's what they're supposed to do. And at the beginning of the response, the antibodies that are made aren't that great. They don't stick that well. The analogy that I've used is that it's sort of like a stamp before you've licked it. That's what those early antibodies are like. So they kind of bounce on and off and you push really hard. Maybe you get it for a little bit. Um, but then what happens is that um, there's this intense competition process so that the not great antibodies um, are, are kicked out and the cells that produce them die off. Uh, and then you sort of expand out the best antibody producing cells and those are the ones that persist. So what it means is that you just don't need nearly as many antibodies to protect you later in the response as you do early. 
So if you really look um, across different studies, you know, the most important metric we look at in terms of antibodies isn't the quantity, it's function. How well do those antibodies prevent the virus from infecting cells? And by and large, those haven't slipped that much, certainly not as much as the total antibody levels. And so I think that's been one little source of frustration for me anyway, is that I hear waning, waning, waning so often that, that I think that clearly we're not doing a great job of explaining what normally happens. And this is exactly what normally happens. That said, um, there, there has been a little bit of waning. And so I think the best data has come from the Moderna trial, where you know at the beginning there was a vaccinated group, a placebo group. Um, and then at the end of it, once they hit their endpoints, um, they, they crossed over. And so then they gave the placebo people their first shot, as is only fair. And so you can then compare how what the level of protection is in people who were vaccinated in that first group versus the second group against Delta virus, right? So that's the perfect set of controls. Okay. It's not this messy data that we're seeing from observational studies across the world, which I can't interpret. I don't think anyone else can either. Um, and it's so, so basically the people that were in the early vaccinated group are only about one and a half times at greater risk than people who were vaccinated in the later group. Um, so to me, you know, the antibody, um, the basics of antibodies, and then this particular crossover trial, I think to me, makes it pretty clear that the major factor here is Delta. It's not so much waning. So what does that mean in terms of the boost? Uh, you know, I immediately, because I'm immunocompromised, so I, you know, immediately got my third full 100 microgram uh, Moderna <laughs> booster, <laughs> which is like before they were recommending that it be 50, but in any event, so I've had like 300 micrograms of, of, uh, of Moderna, uh, you know, vaccine. So I'm like to the max. <laughs> Godspeed, um, Susan. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, an experiment. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, for, um, for, for everyone else who is eligible, and I guess there are all the different categories of eligibility, which I find um, just really, like, unfortunately, like a lot of the messaging, really too complicated. Um, yeah. But, you know, if, if you're in the category, let's just say that. So in one of these, these categories uh, where it's time to get a booster, um, should you go get a booster? Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's the big question here. And so let me just have a gal for a confession here. Yeah. I actually just got a booster yesterday. So I teach, right? So that puts me in the right category. And so How are you my apology, not the best, Susan, um, <laughs> but I'll fight through it. <laughs> um, uh, but so I might, I, what I want to do is actually go through the decision making process that got me to that, um, okay. because there's a lot of different factors. And it really has more to do with those around me more than me. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in just a minute. Um, so boosters. So, um, you know, what we have is actually some really remarkable data from Pfizer um, that uh, followed out, again, their original trial participants and gave some of them a third shot and looked to see how much better are those people who got boosted doing than those who got just two shots. Um, and I really, I didn't know what to think. I mean, I kind of thought this was just, I don't know, overfilling the cup. That's sort of what I thought it was going to be. Um, but I was, I was pretty surprised in that what they found is that there's a 20 times lower risk of getting symptomatic infection at all if you get that third booster relative to people who already had two doses. Yeah. So that's something, right? Because the people who had two doses, it's not like they're back to zero. Right. And so, you know, we're talking like 99%. I mean, it, it's astronomical, the yeah. level of protection that, that you're getting from that booster shot. So then what that means then is that has some implications for transmission. I mean, as you said, the most important shots we can give uh, would be to people who haven't had any shots yet, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think we're clearly, we're clearly, we're hitting an asymptote on this. Um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to sort of push forward. I imagine mandates will bump it up a little bit, right? But we're really, yeah. progress is pretty slow. Right. Yeah, no, I so, think the mandate, without the mandates, we'd be cooked. There's, yeah, I mean, I, we would have hit a wall. So I, you know, I imagine that a lot of the, the new shots we're seeing now are probably because of the mandate. I mean, I don't know that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so um, then what it means then is then again, certainly from a personal risk standpoint, the likelihood of passing it on to someone else um, is much less if you have a booster because the likelihood of getting infected in the first place is so, so much lower. Mm -hmm. um, and in Israel, we're seeing like overall infections, you know, it's like an over 90% eff effective um, from that third booster. So obviously, if you're not infected, you can't give it to anyone else. Right. So, so it really, so that was sort of the process for me as to why I got it yesterday. 
Um, there's a few things, um, and I'll just explain how I reason my way through this. Because I, you know, I'm, I'm on record saying the immune response is doing fine. I don't see any particular reason that we need to be doing this. It's more of a want rather than a need. And I think all of those things are totally still true, but a few things. First, um, Arizona is starting to go up fast uh, in terms of cases. And, you know, whereas we've been pretty good at protecting and trying to keep the campus in a little bit of a distinct bubble, it's not really a bubble, but we've done a pretty good job of keeping things under control on campus. It's starting to spike on campus too. So then that puts, puts me a, a little bit of a risk of getting infected. Again, I'm not that worried about getting really sick, but my father is in town, he's in his 80s. Um, and that's a different thing altogether, right? And so I finally managed to get himself a, uh, get, convince him to get a, um, a booster, but he, hasn't, he doesn't have it yet. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. And then finally, um, you know, my kids just got their first shot last weekend. And so I just didn't want to, I didn't want to like punt so close to the finish line. I think that's, that, those are sort of the major reasons. Final point. We don't know how long these boosters will confer immunity. Will they stay at this level in perpetuity or is it a sharp rise and a sharp crash? And I honestly don't know. It really could be either. I think that people are sort of taking it as a given that it'll be really transient, but there are so many examples one way or the other that we don't really know. So my philosophy here was sort of like what you do in the flu season is you kind of try to wait until right before the flu season to make sure that you've got that immunity that allows you to sort of carry it forward. So those are all the reasons that uh, I did it and I'm traveling to Philly next week. So there's just a lot of reasons that I thought, you know, I don't want to do this. I have a rough time after I get these shots and I have a bit, a bit of a rough time today, um, but I think it was clearly the right thing to do for me given these circumstances. Well, I think the point that you make about transmissibility to others, um, you know, I think it's really fantastic that the five-year-olds now uh, are, are able to, um, to get boosters. Um, you know, in our family, we've got an 18-month-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old. And, -year -old, and um, you know, those, those two families are living in a different world. Yeah. Um, you know, they're living in, a, in a, an unvaccinated world with, with little children. Uh, and I think there's also a lot of confusion um, about, uh, you know, how, how at risk uh, small children were. And, you know, we've kind of gone from these bold statements of, you know, little children don't get, don't get the virus, which is clearly not true. Um, right. And, you know, some children have died, yeah. um, you know, and we're seeing even the ones who, uh, you know, uh, the, the majority who, you know, don't have a, a you know, a mortality, uh, you know, event uh, have, um, uh, there's a lot of the, you know, kind of, uh, long COVID uh, cases. What? what yeah, are I mean, that? and do we have it? I know that we were supposed to have the data. I know several children uh, have spoken to their parents um, who are infants who were in uh, both the Moderna and Pfizer trials, and the data was supposed to be available by Thanksgiving. Um, have you heard anything about uh, when we're going to hear about the little the little kids? No. I um, mean, I've heard from governmental officials that they anticipate that, that, that the youngest kids are a few months behind the five to yeah. 11 year olds. So, you know, my guess is it'll probably be sometime early next year. Yeah, yeah. Does yeah, I mean, I, I, and so I think this is one of the, the challenges here. I mean, I know uh, that, that the relative likelihood of a young child getting extremely sick is low. Right. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to recognize what that would mean, you know, even if it's rare for a young child to, to get this and then, you know, have severe consequences from what was a preventable issue, right? I mean, that's not acceptable. No. Now, our pediatric ICUs here were full um, as of a couple of months ago, full, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, in an absolute sense, um, I'm, you know, there's not that many kids that are getting super sick, right? But, but to me, it's just a total tragedy. I mean, this, you can't let that happen. So that's, right. um, that's, that was sort of, you know, obviously our thinking on this. And, you know, there are some things that I don't love about the way that the trials were run. I mean, I think the number of participants was low. I don't like that. Um, and so, you know, but, but at the same time, and I think we need to be a little bit Asian here too, right? I mean, what's clear is that they dropped the dose. Um, even the adverse events uh, that were there for the 12 to 17 year olds, for instance, are, are much lower because- so they probably don't seem because, to be there. What's that? They, they don't seem to be there. You think it's dose related? I think it's probably dose related. Again, it could be something about the sort of developing immune system. I'm not really sure. Um, and so, you know, when you look at just the number of doses that have been given, I think you can just be a little bit Asian about this. And again, I don't love it. I really think that they should have had 10 times more kids in that trial than they did. Um, but at the same time, I think that we need to use a little bit of inference here 
based upon what we've already seen, um, and a little, just a little bit of logic in terms of, you know, if the adverse events aren't there at the beginning, you know, generally that correlates pretty well with what may or may not happen later. Well, and I think that in general, we've got this, um, uh, this kind of vague notion of, you know, uh, of, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the long term, but we do know what's going to happen in the short term. If you yeah. get COVID, it's really bad. If you're unvaccinated and, and you get COVID, young people, people in their teens, in their 20s, in their 30s, people who, you know, are like at the gym every morning at, you know, 5 a.m., they are getting COVID and dying if they're not vaccinated. And, I, you know, people are not recognizing this because they're thinking about, you know, they can protect themselves, you know, by eating, uh, you know, eating healthy and working out all the time. And that's just not the case. What, what can we, what can we say to adults who are putting things off because they're concerned about long-term side effects and also for parents who are, you know, they, they want to do the right thing for their children and they're worried about putting something in their child. But I, I think people are, to me, they're really underestimating this risk. I, I think that's a, this is a really important point because I think people are looking at it as either you get vaccinated or you don't get vaccinated. That's your choice, but that's not your choice, right? The choice before you is do you get vaccinated or do you get COVID? Delta has ensured that. So right. what you're weighing is the risk of getting the infection versus the vaccine. Um, and that's not even a contest at this point. I mean, we've seen that. We've seen this, right? So I, I think that um, what we need to do is reframe that discussion a little bit. Um, and, you know, all the things that the virus does, it evades the immune system, it generates this massive inflammatory response, it gets into your lungs so that, you know, it makes it difficult for your lungs to work right. These are not things that the vaccine does. Okay, so that's point one. Second thing is that when we look at long term effects of vaccines, um, you know, there, I can't, I have a very difficult time thinking of examples where you get the vaccine, everything's fine, and then only 10 years later does something happen. I can't think of any examples that are like that. I don't believe there um, are any examples. I mean, yeah, I, you know, there's some weird things with um, dengue virus vaccines and, and enhancement and stuff like that, but that's pretty clearly, that's, that specific problem is not at play here. Um, so, but it, it has more to do with when you get exposed to the virus. It doesn't have anything to do intrinsically with the vaccine. So I, I think when you add these things up um, and then sort of just the biology of these, these vaccines is they don't stick around for very long, right? Um, you know, the, the spike protein gets made for a few days and then it's gone. Um, and so it, 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 you know, I think what we have to do is just use a little bit of common sense here when we're looking at it forward. And, you know, how likely is it that you're going to have long-term effects that are worse than the infection? I think that's the choice before us. And I think also, um, you know, the uh, uh, women in pregnancy, uh, you know, now, I mean, we've heard from, uh, you know, the obstetric societies, uh, you know, that say it is essential that pregnant women get vaccinated because, of course, with the increased blood supply and everything, they're at much more risk of, uh, of you know, having a, a, a terrible situation if, uh, if they get COVID while they're pregnant. Yet there's this fear. Yeah, and, and to be honest, I mean, I understand, right? Um, and to a certain extent, I mean, you know, honestly, even when we took our boys to get vaccinated this weekend, it's just like a little bit of nervousness, right? Even I have that. Of course. Um, and so, so in this sense, I understand. I totally sympathize. I totally get it. Again, the choice before you here is risking the virus versus the vaccine. So for pregnant women, um, there's a lot of changes, as you said. Um, there's a lot of changes that happen. One of the most important ones is that you have a certain degree of immune suppression because you don't want to reject the baby. Right. Um, and so then that puts pregnant women at extra high risk in some ways. In okay, fact, you're immunocompromised. In effect, you're immunocompromised. And so we've, we, it's, it's just tragic. We've had women landing in our eyes, pregnant women landing in our ICU, and they just can't imagine anything worse than that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that if the professional society that studies pregnancies, right, um, is telling you to do so, I mean, that means something. And there's a reason for it, right? These physicians are seeing the consequences of, of not getting that vaccine. Well, I think the, um, I think the point that you're, you're making is that, that Delta is going to find you. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you're, if you're sick of COVID and you know, pretty much everybody has, expresses that if you spend enough time with them, you know, they're just really, they're sick of COVID, they're over COVID. You know, they express it in different ways. 
But you know, my response is you may be over COVID, but COVID is really not over you. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of lurking there. And you know, if you're protected, you know, you've done everything you can, you've gotten your, your vaccinations, you've gotten your, your boosters, you still, you know, have to be, well, we should talk about that. What kind of precautions do you have to take? Um, because that's a, that's a real question. But, uh, but if you are not vaccinated and you're depending upon, you know, eating, eating healthy and, uh, and working out all the time and, and wearing a mask, um, you're playing a, a big game of, of, uh, of Russian roulette for yourself and those people that you're around. I mean, the vaccines are by far our best weapon. Um, I mean, I think, I, I don't love wearing masks. I don't know who does, right? And I'm looking forward to the day where we can drop them. And I think the vaccines are out there for sure. Um, yeah. you know, I think that these are the things that we had to do, these non-pharmaceutical interventions that were really hard on people, right? Um, distancing, small gatherings, only meeting outside. Um, you know, these are, these are things that are, that's a huge social cost and the vaccines are the way out of it. And that's how I see it. Um, there are other options and I know we're gonna talk about some things going forward that will make it even better. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm tired of it. I'm sick of COVID, I'm over COVID. Um, and I'd like for it to be done with us too. And I think this is the way out of it. So in terms of, uh, you know, let, let's, let's, you know, be, be, um, be hopeful uh, that, you know, even the littlest kids uh, will get, you know, vaccinated or be eligible to be vaccinated uh, by first quarter uh, of, you know, 2022. And then we'll, uh, you know, hopefully uh, get the international uh, community vaccinated because that's, um, you know, we have to get rid of COVID everywhere. Uh, but just to follow on um, before we leave the booster front, um, uh, really two things. So if you have had COVID and then um, are vaccinated with one, uh, one vaccination, some people have been arguing that COVID was your first, your vaccination is your second, uh, do you need a second vaccination and do you need a booster? So what are your thoughts on, on the um, protection conferred by, you know, COVID plus a vaccine? Yeah, it, it's maxed out. I, I agree with that sentiment. I mean, if you look at antibodies, T cells, there's no additional benefit from that second shot afterwards. And so they're actually right. In fact, any, if anything, if you look at, the, at the, all the immune response after one shot, when you've recovered from COVID, it's better than um, someone who's gotten just two shots of the vaccine who'd never had COVID before. It's what we call hybrid immunity. Um, and there's a little bit of data. I mean, that's, yeah. So, so I, I, you know, there's a little bit of data from coming out of Israel. I don't think these were one shot people, but, you know, people who got some number of shots after having recovered from COVID and, you know, the incidence of COVID is extremely, extremely low in, in that population. So I agree with that. I imagine I think it's probably the two, it's probably a, uh, a two shot. Um, and then the question is, do you get a COVID, two shots, do you get a booster? I, yeah, I know I wouldn't. You know, if I were in that position and I've covered from COVID, I would stop after one additional shot. The data are pretty right. clear on this, yeah. So COVID, one shot or COVID? Yep. Then I'm done, yep. One shot and you're done. So yep. let's talk about the J&J &J folks. Um, so the people who got the J&J &J vaccine um, are now, what do, you, what do you tell them? If, uh, if they want to get their, their second shot, should they get a second J&J &J shot or should they get an mRNA vaccine? Or should they just say, I had my J&J &J shot, I'm done? Yeah, and so let me, let me actually back up just a little bit to what I was saying before. There's sort of a divide a little bit between people who want to see large-scale clinical trials before you say anything. Yeah. Um, and then there's me um, and other immunologists. It's like, let's use a little bit of logic here. I mean, the mechanism of action of a vaccine is inducing antibodies and T cells, and we can measure that. And so, um, you know, by and large, these correlate pretty well with how well the vaccine works. So the J&J, &J, um, you know, I have a feeling that the CDC, they can be a little conservative on this front, is going to recommend that you just get another shot of the J&J. &J. I'm not really sure, right? I'm not sure they haven't said that. They said you can mix and match. But if you look at the antibody levels, um, in someone who had a J and J vaccine and they came back with an mRNA vaccine, they're way higher than someone who gets two shots of J and J. There's a number of reasons for that. You know, the J and J vaccine is different. Right? It's an adenovirus-based uh, uh, vaccine, and so what can happen in these kinds of vaccines is that you generate immunity 
not only to the spike protein that's encoded in the adenovirus, but also to the adenovirus vector itself. So that when you come back with another adenovirus immunization later, you've got a bunch of antibodies that prevent that adenovirus from doing what it needs to do. So I don't know if that's the mechanism as to why the J&J shot's doing a little bit worse. Um, but you know, again, if I were in that position and I had had the J&J shot, I'd get an mRNA shot, not another J&J. Yeah, I was very surprised that that wasn't the, uh, the CDC um, uh, you know, uh, recommendation. But in general, let's talk about mixing and matching. Um, so uh, if you've had two Pfizer's, do you go for a, uh, a J&J? Do you go for a Moderna? Do you stick with your Pfizer? Um, yeah, well, I stuck with Pfizer uh, yesterday. Um, there are some data out of the UK on this, and there is a little, some switching around of, of things. Um, main, yeah, I mean, so they had some different um, recommendations as to which populations get which shot, because um, there was a little bit of worry that the AstraZeneca vaccine over there was causing these sort of rare thrombolytic events um, yes. in, in women under the age of, I believe, 50. So they kind of actually did a little bit of this stuff where they told people to switch midstream. Um, you know, and by and large, it doesn't make a huge, huge difference, I would say. I mean, where it makes an absolutely huge difference is if you recover from COVID, from the actual infection, and then you get a shot. I mean, that's through the roof. I mean, that's like so much higher than anything we get just from the vaccines, from like straight vaccines. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in general, it seems like the mRNAs are the better way to go for that booster shot. I think that's the general rule. It's not orders of magnitude different, um, but, I, you know, it's it, every little bit probably counts here. So people who have had a breakthrough, have had their, their, you know, series, their two shots, um, or their one shot of, uh, of J&J, and then have had a breakthrough COVID case. Mm -hmm. Do they need a booster? No, I don't think so. There's a nice data that came out of Dan Baruch's group uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, where they followed people. You know, there's that big Provincetown outbreak yes. um, where a bunch of people, I mean, the overwhelming majority of people were vaccinated um, and were the source of the breakthrough infections. Again, no one, I mean, hardly anyone got sick, got really sick. Um, but they've now gone in and looked at some of the antibody levels. And it's sort of like what it is when you get infected and then a booster. Um, now it's the other way around, but the data look more or less the same. I mean, you get just an astronomical response from it. So, so you therefore would not suggest that people get a booster if they've had a full series of uh, their, their two shots or their one J and J shot and then got COVID. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, I think they're and, done. And, yeah, I, I think so. I and mean, again, the, 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 the you know, the levels, you just look at the, you know, levels of our markers of immunity. Um, it, it's, it's very high. It's higher than what you get from two shots of either mRNA vaccine by quite a bit. Um, and then what happens is that if you have so many antibodies that are already there, um, even if you get another vaccine, those antibodies just suck up whatever bit of spike protein is made. And then you don't really generate much of a new immune response. That's again, one of the reasons why when you're really maxed out, I don't see the point of just like rigidly holding to this regimen where you've got to get two shots or you've got to get a booster if you're in the right category. I think we need to, again, we need to be a little more nimble and logical on this. Well, it's part of the problem that we don't have um, commercial lab testing of, uh, of T cell immunity and, uh, and, and I don't know how good the antibody tests are that we have that are available commercially. The T cells are tough, um, and we've done a lot of this ourselves in the, in the sense that it's just really extremely variable from person to person. Um, so it, it becomes actually pretty difficult, particularly for vaccines, um, to get a test together for T cells that would be sufficiently sensitive and specific enough for the FDA to sit to sign off on. There are a couple of tests, or one test that I know of that works just through sequencing the T cell receptors um, for infection as a way of diagnosing previous infection. Um, but to my knowledge, there's nothing like that that exists for vaccines. You know, the vaccines, you're focusing on just one protein um, right. in the viral genome, which is the reason why it, you can't get COVID from the vaccine, for instance, right? It's just one protein. Um, but that, what that means is that for T cells, I mean, they're all sort of like aiming their fire at this one protein, and it, it's really variable from person to person. So, so I'm not have like a baseline on the person, um, you know, and then check again. Yeah, you can. And, and again, we have done this. You know, we published a study where we were looking at um, booster responses in people who had cancer or on active chemo. 
And we did a lot of this, you know, for our control group as well, you know, looking before the vaccine, what did the T cells look like? What is it and what does it look like afterwards? And it's just like some people mount these huge T cell responses. Some of them don't mount them at all, as far as we can tell. I mean, it's not like antibodies. And the antibodies are actually pretty good. Our antibody test is pretty good in this regard. Um, but I think what we need to do is to start to move towards antibody tests that actually measure antibody function, not right. just quantity. They all circling all the way back around to what we talked about at the beginning is that what you really want to do is measure the ability of the antibodies to block the virus from getting inside of cells. So there are a few things the FDA has been sort of not trying to nudge people forward into some more standardized assays, because ultimately the goal is, you know, you take a test and that will tell you, do you need a booster or not? That's the ideal goal, right? You don't want to have to go through like month long, you know, five month long clinical trials every single time you want to update. You need an immune correlate. And I think we'll get there. Um, it's just been hard because the virus is a bit of a moving target because what we needed before Delta is different than what we need now. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, you know, most people uh, now are very excited about, uh, you know, the monoclonal antibodies or the, you know, the antivirals. Um, what do you think of them? Uh, are they going to be preventatives and are we going to have enough of them? Um, yeah, well, so there's two, there's two modes of action here. I mean, there's two different categories of drugs. There's the oral antivirals. Uh, Merck has one that should, I imagine, will be getting authorized very soon. Um, and then Pfizer has another one. And then what's nice is they actually, the mechanism of action is different for those two. Um, and so one can envision a strategy where you use both and you sort of shut off, you know, virus infections really quickly. Um, so that's good, right? Because I think, you know, one of the things that people are still worrying about is, okay, yeah, I'm vaccinated. I'm even boosted. You know, I still don't want to get a infection. And so I think... Um, you know, we do need to sort of bring people back a little bit, right? Because I feel like we've kind of hit a point now where the risks that were tolerable pre-pandemic are somehow not anymore. Um, and so I think, I think like having, making it clear to people that there are options so that even if you do get a breakthrough infection, there are things we can do um, to shut things off and make sure that it doesn't go that badly. I mean, hopefully that's a really important step towards returning to normalcy. Um, the monoclonals are a little different because um, they, for the most part up until this point, have been used after you have symptoms, which is really not the right and ideal time to use a monoclonal antibody. You, what, ideally, what you want is those antibodies to be there ahead of time. And so for me, it was really frustrating that, um, that the original trials were never done prophylactically. And so I don't know, you know, that was really frustrating to me. But um, you know, the AstraZeneca now has a new monoclonal antibody app that just looks incredible, where they've engineered the, um, the stem of the antibody so that these things stick around for very, very long periods of time, and it actually becomes feasible to use them prophylactically. Um, and, uh, you know, so they've done some trials in people who are immune compromised, and it looks like it does really well in preventing um, these folks from getting sick. This is obviously a very highly susceptible group. Uh, to have this option, I think, is, again, another thing that we sort of checked off the list, you know, in terms of things that we need to worry about. I think that there had always been this concern that, yes, okay, lots of people are getting vaccinated, but what about the people who have suppressed immune systems? We can't just forget them. Now we have some good options to try and deal with these things prophylactically. Um, so, how yeah. long does that prophylaxis last? Because you can't stay on these monoclonal antibodies, uh, you know, forever. Yeah, no, it's, it, no, I mean, that's true, right? So, I mean, I think they were saying that they can actually detect these things for up to a year, which is incredible. Um, so the way that they do this, and normally like an antibody, you know, the half-life of an antibody is about three, four weeks. Um, so that's not really feasible, that's not practical, right? You can't like take uh, IV injections of antibodies every few weeks, you can't do that. Um, but, you know, this thing then, if you get one injection intramuscularly and it lasts for a year, that's a different thing altogether. Um, and I think it becomes like, you know if we're talking about getting boosters, I think we're getting a little feedback here. Um, but yeah, if we take these things sort of, you know, as you maybe you need it once a year, that's not that much different than the vaccines, at least as how we're viewing it right now. And so I think it's a, it's a totally viable option. It'll be interesting if, see if people who are, do you think that will be an alternative option for people who are worried about the, um, for whatever reason, uh, are reluctant to take a vaccine? I mean, I would imagine they would have the same uh, concerns about monoclonal antibodies, but. 
I don't know. Right. I mean, they haven't, I mean, I think that, I mean, just been the weirdest thing to watch of how, um, you know, really based upon political divides, people are so much more willing to take monoclonal antibodies on one side than the vaccine. Um, is it weird, like weird, right? So I, I, I'm not, it's really hard for me to predict what human behavior will actually be. They might be more willing to take monoclonals. Um, you know, and then I think the more options we have going forward, the better. I mean, I don't care, you know, which of these things people take really. You know, it's obviously more expensive to take a monoclonal antibody than a vaccine, but if that's the way forward, then so be it, as I see it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, then we're going to start getting some more traditional types of vaccines. Finally, we're going to get Novavax, which is a more of a, you know, standard protein-based vaccine. And, you know, there could be a, a fraction of people that are more willing to take that than the mRNA vaccines or J&J. &J. Um, so whatever it takes to get there. I mean, I, at this point, again, you know, like I said, I'm done with COVID too, even though, even if it's not done with us. So do you see um, uh, COVID vaccines as basically something we're going to be doing in the future uh, on an annual basis, like, uh, you know, taking our flu shots? I think there'll be options to take it annually. Whether you need to take it annually is a different thing altogether. Um, I mean, there's a lot of differences in the biology of coronaviruses and flu, for instance. I mean, the flu, flu can actually undergo pretty dramatic changes. And, you know, basically the flu genome is, is um, split apart into these different segments. And so if you get two different flu strains that infect the same cell, they can swap pieces around and you basically are left with something completely different than what went in. So that, that's what makes flu kind of dangerous in this sense. The coronaviruses by and large don't do this, right? They sort of just slowly mutate one thing at a time. Um, and so I don't anticipate the same level of viral evolution in coronavirus as we do in flu year in, year out. Um, then again, I think the other issue is that the flu vaccines aren't the best. Um, there's a lot of things about them that where they, you know, they really only confer protection for about six months or so. Right. Um, and I, you know, what's clear is that these vaccines are better. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little hopeful, a little hopeful that it'll be a little bit less frequent than a year uh, that you'll need to get it. Um, but my guess is that it will be made available to whoever wants it every year. So uh, there was talk um, initially about, I think, especially from Moderna, uh, about doing a combined uh, flu and, uh, and COVID uh, shot, you know, you're taking one shot. Um, I mean, I would, I would opt for that as opposed to, uh, you know, as opposed to two, but I tend to be a, you know, belt and suspenders person. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what people will want to do because I mean, the current flu vaccine on one hand, it's not that great. Yeah. Um, you know, year in, year out, it's maybe 40, 50% effective against all the different flu, you know, the four different flu strains that it's trying to protect you against. Um, right. So, but at the same time, it doesn't bother people, you know, there's no adjuvant in it. It doesn't cause a ton of inflammation, uh, except for older people where they've actually started adding adjuvants down to it. But, um, you know, will people decide to work and get something that makes them feel a little bit worse for longer term and better protection? I, I don't actually know that. Um, we'll, we'll find out how that goes. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the adjuvants. Um, you know, having had an adjuvant uh, flu vaccine, I'm, I've opted this year for a non-adjuvant uh, yeah. flu vaccine. I'm like, right. no, thank you. No, thank you. Um, because the, the adjuvant is what uh, was challenging for me. Um, so what, uh, what do you think we can, uh, we can look forward to in, uh, uh, in 2022, COVID-wise? Well... I mean, it's kind of, when is this thing going to go away? Are we going to, are we still going to be masking? Are we still going to be social distancing? Uh, what, what's your, what is your crystal ball with all the qualifications? That, you know, we can yeah, you know, last time you asked me about crystal ball, Susan, I got it badly, badly, badly wrong because I did not foresee Delta. Um, exactly. So I don't know. It's like, I'm a little reluctant to make those kinds of predictions. I mean, here's what I will say. Today. Yeah. <laughs> Here's what I would say is that we've got all of the options now in front of us to protect us. Um, and so I think that uh, people's willingness to do to, you know, follow these non pharmaceutical interventions is just going to start to diminish more and more and more and more. Um, and I don't doubt that there'll be pockets of people who will always wear masks on subway on the subway or, or, or whatever. Um, but I don't see yes, maybe. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, again, I mean, you assess your own risk, but you know, and social distancing and particularly like, you know, like not traveling to see family. I mean, I just, that's not, it's not tenable, right? People need to see family. It's important. Yeah, we're social beings, it matters. Yeah. So I, I don't, I think that um, it's not going to happen all of a sudden, 
But what's going to happen gradually over time is that people are just going to get so sick of it. Know that there are options in front of them that basically turns this into not anywhere near the threat that it's been the past you know, year and a half, uh, and then start to move on with their lives. That's certainly my intention. Um, and I imagine that I'm not alone on that. Well, you know, with holiday season coming up, right, Thanksgiving being a huge uh, travel holiday, and then, you know, all of the holidays in December, I think, you know, Hanukkah starts on the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and, you know, then we've got uh, Christmas, uh, you know, and Kwanzaa, and everybody getting together for all these holidays. Um, and in many families, um, you know, mine is no exception, the conversation is, you know, you've got the full range of people, um, and, and different ages. So uh, do, you, do you think that we're going to see a, a big surge after, the, uh, uh, after these holidays? Um, I don't know if it'll be a big surge. My guess is we'll see a surge. Yeah. Um, the magnitude of it is hard for me to predict. Um, you know, again, I think when we circle back to what we were talking about at the beginning, I mean, I think that as there are fewer and fewer people who are not immune in some way, um, then what's, what I think should happen is that you'll start to see the, the magnitudes of these peaks start to diminish a little bit. So we'll see it. It's very difficult for me to know what the size of that surge is actually going to be. It'll, it'll probably be there, um, but hopefully it'll be small. That's, that's certainly my hope. Well, you know, in the winter in Arizona, where you are, is very different than the winter in New York City. And I was thinking about this Saturday night as I was sitting outdoors in a restaurant. It was only about 42 degrees. Uh, I was I was very warm above the table where the heat lamp could reach. Um, my knees were freezing, and uh, you know I thought this is really getting old. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know I, that's where I think rapid testing the uh, really has a um, a significant role. I know I have a stack of uh, you know of the, um, the rapid antigen. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so what we've tended to do is, um, you know, if we're, we're going to see two or three people, is to just everybody tests about an hour or so before we're going to get together. And uh, now, these are also folks who choose to, um, to conduct themselves in a way that we're comfortable with, uh, you know, so that kind of, we, we feel we've, you know, brought their risk down. Although, you know, when you really have a conversation uh, it's like, well, you know, we really don't see anybody except, and then there's a long list. Um, but, you know, if it's, uh, if people are being, you know, fairly uh, uh, mindful of, you know, their kind of daily contacts, um, we found that to be a, a pretty good uh, way of, um, of keeping safe and not, you know, getting pneumonia because you're sitting outdoors when it's 25 degrees. Yeah, and I think these are the kinds of creative solutions that we need to have. We have so many options at our table to sort of keep things under control. Um, and they're, you, you know, the those tests, you, using those tests. I mean, I know if you're in England, you know, they're free and you just get yeah. them here. They're still, you know, 25 bucks for two or something. That's the tragedy. It, re yeah. it really is. Um, and, you know, here you can't actually get rapid tests at CVS or Walgreens. Um, and they're just out. Um, and right now, this is exactly when we need it because cases are starting to climb again. So it's really frustrating how poorly we've handled this. Yes, you can get a PCR test, but you know something I mean, like my dad got, you know, he had a, he had a cold uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago. And so he couldn't get a rapid test. Thankfully, I actually had one, but he went ahead and get a PCR test anyway, right? Um, right. And it took seven days to get his result back. Oh my That's God. useless. It's completely useless. That's, and, that's, and I cannot believe that here we are towards the end of 2021 and we're still fighting this battle. It's just, it's completely inexcusable. Well, I've heard a lot that the standards that the FDA um, has been using for that diagnostic is absolutely wrong. I mean, we need like, you know, a pandemic standard. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, there are all of these great tests. I know at Brown, they just developed one that they call the bubble test, um, which uh, I, it's a breath test. It was designed for kids. So they blow bubbles and the solution will turn a color depending on what it is. I think it then requires, you know, being sent off to a lab uh, or, you know, the, the swab, the oral swab test. So you're not sticking that thing, you know, halfway to your brain. Um, and th there are just, you know, I, uh, Fung, uh, you know, Fung was uh, coming up with a, with a test that was, um, you know, like really, really cheap. Um, and it's just getting it through, you know, that very, very narrow, uh, 
you know, shoot that the FDA has, uh, has set up is, is challenging. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the big things that I really wish would change, which is having a separate regulatory framework for public health based tests versus exactly. clinical tests. And they don't have it, right? And so they actually know it too. So they'll give you a little wink, wink. You know, it's like, if you have a standing order from a doctor, you can use it off label for this or that. Right. Um, and, you know, by and large, I mean, like these, these rapid antigen tests that, you know, they're, they're actually not authorized to use for asymptomatic, but we use it anyway, because our, you know, our president is a physician and he writes a general script for everyone. And then they basically are able to use it off label in that way. But this is absurd, right? right. This is absurd. I think that, um, you know, if we could simply, you know, like you brush your teeth, you take your, you know, your swab test or your bubble test or, you know, your whatever test it is, and then you know that you're okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I totally agree with you. And so, yeah, we're actually going to take some of these things to a conference that, you know, I'm on the advisory council for a conference that we have in uh, Asilomar, Monterey each year. Yeah. And yeah, we're going to take these things along with us, right? It just, it just makes so much sense. Absolutely. And uh, I was talking with someone who runs a, um, a children's mental health organization and they're having their annual fundraiser. And I said, well, besides asking people to be vaccinated, you know, they're going to be eating and drinking. So they're not going to be wearing masks or not for very long. Um, are you having people rapid test? Um, yeah. And he said, well, that's a good idea. I said, and it's critical. That's how, you know, the, the TV and film productions have been able to go back into business. That's what you know, that's what happens. It should happen at any kind of a mass, uh, a mass gathering. Um, but then, I, you know, people start calculating out. Says, well, think how much you spend on your, you know, on your gala, you know. Just yeah, right. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think this is the key thing. I mean, I think about like, what would be the least disruptive way to stay safe, right? You know, one or two or three shot vaccine, but that's one off, you're done. Right. An antigen test, you know, you, you take it, but then you can enjoy yourself for the rest of the evening or whatever, right? I mean, these are not disruptive. Masks, I can't see the end of those soon enough, to be honest, you know? So I'll be happy when those are gone. Uh, but there's some of these things that really can make a big difference and probably a bigger difference than masks. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think that's right. Um, I wanna turn to, uh, to questions because we have, um, I think we've actually uh, covered um, uh, a bunch of them, but I think we have uh, some, so the effects of long, long-term effects of COVID, um, there were, you know, small studies uh, now, maybe some larger ones on uh, brain imaging. Um, you know, we, we personally, uh, you know, have experience with people who, you know, still have not regained their sense of, uh, of smell and taste after a very long period of time. So um, anything, uh, anything that we should know about this? No, uh, and it's a very, very difficult thing to study. Um, there is a very you know, controversial, but I think probably well done uh, study that came out of France where they looked at people who had antibodies to um, SARS-CoV-2 versus those who did not, and then sort of queried them for long COVID symptoms. And you know, what was striking is that with the exception of the loss of smell, there really wasn't any difference between those groups. Um, and so it's really hard to study and figure out what the actual frequency is of people who really struggle with this. It's definitely real, but you hear some estimates that I think are probably higher than what it really is. You know, you hear 20%, 40%, that I don't think is real. Um, but there are some things that are unequivocally true. You know people that have had to fight through this, um, but it's so hard to get at the mechanism when there's this sort of this background level of stuff that people get from really any, when they recover from any infection. And so. That's the real challenge. You know, we have a big study going on here. I'm not involved in the long COVID study here, but it's mainly just collecting a ton of samples from people who have long COVID symptoms. And uh, at the very minimum, trying to find some biomarkers that would allow us to understand what might be going wrong. But my best feeling is that it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be really heterogeneous uh, and it's gonna be tough. So for an unvaccinated person um, who gets COVID, I think we talked about this, but um, we're, we're having some recent question, so maybe it didn't sink in, but for an unvaccinated person um, who has gotten COVID, do we know how long uh, their immunity is compared to a vaccinated person? Not really. Um, I'd say that most of the studies, there's a few outliers one way or the other, but most of the studies say that it's in the same ballpark um, of vaccinated versus recovering from infection. But you know, one thing I'll say is that there's a huge degree of variability 
uh, in the immune response is after you recover from infection. And it sort of correlates with how bad your symptoms were. Like if you landed in the hospital and managed to get out of that, um, you know, the antibody levels are probably high enough where you don't really need to worry about it too, too much. But, you know, if you're an asymptomatic case or very mild symptoms, that oftentimes means and correlates with lower levels of responses. Um, but regardless, even though there's all that variability, I mean, what we're seeing is that if you get one shot, it sort of maxes everything out. Um, and so, again, you know, I, I do think that when we're talking about mandates and, and whatnot, you know, I do think that there should be some consideration of people who recover from infection, but that shouldn't be a blanket waiver from getting vaccinated at all. I think it should mean that it's a waiver from the second shot. Right, right. Yeah, what um, uh, I know um, Eric Topol and a few other folks uh, felt very strongly that, uh, you know, that one shot uh, in addition to a COVID infection, um, the one shot was essential, but you know, the, the COVID shot really was, was super, super uh, important. So, um, you know, regarding uh, COVID um, vaccinations and, and boosters, um, you know, some people are saying that they, older adults generally experience less side effects than younger adults and why. Now, defining myself as an older adult, I certainly did not find that to be the case. So I'm not sure, um, but uh, uh, I, I guess some people are saying, you know, they worry if they've had a shot and they, and they don't have a, a strong reaction. Yeah, let me revisit that because we talked about this last time because, you know, my wife had no reactions. Maybe she was thirsty. That was basically her reaction, right? And I felt more or less like I do today, which is not awesome after the second shot. And I really, really thought that I would actually benefit from that, you know, a little pain at the beginning and you get some gain later, but it just wasn't the case. She actually has had higher antibodies than I did at the end. So it's, it seems like it doesn't correlate at all. We've also done some studies, um, you know, we run a large antibody uh, study uh, here out of the University of Arizona. And we started asking people, um, did you take painkillers? Um, because there had been some thought that maybe painkillers of different classes might suppress the vaccine response. Um, and by and large, no. I mean, maybe a tiny bit for aspirin, but Tylenol, naproxen, ibuprofen, nothing, no effect whatsoever. So, you know, it just doesn't seem like how terrible you feel. And this is unfortunate for, for both you and me, yeah. um, actually correlates that well with how well your immune uh, system gets going. Right. So some people are just kind of, kind of lucky. I, I know for me, it was, uh, it was, it was Tylenol and getting under the covers and, uh, <laughs> sleeping and then I got better yeah. um, and you know there we are and I put a lot of ice on my arm um, <laughs> well uh, I think um, you know I think the what we're seeing now with the children that are getting uh, you know the uh, the 12 12 and ups and the and the five and ups um, they're doing fine uh, yeah. you know the, what we hear is well gee my arm hurts but you know they get that after uh, you know after all the other vaccines they get uh, and, you know, or they're tired, um, but they go to sleep and then they're fine. So, uh, you know, hopefully, I, I wish there was a way that we could just say, you know, get vaccinated because otherwise you will get COVID. And I just, and yeah. you don't want to have COVID. And no, it's not just like having a bad cold. Yeah, right. It's miserable. It's a miserable experience for sure. So, and I, I think, uh, I don't know who, who, who said it first, but I know that a lot of the public health people are, it's not about vaccines. It's, it's not how many vaccines doses we have, it's how many vaccinations yeah. we have. Right. Um, and so the messaging on that and the people who are waiting and, you know, forget kind of the, uh, you know, the social media echo chamber of, you know, conspiracy theories and things like that. Um, uh, we've seen very drastic actions by, um, uh, by one uh, country, Singapore, which is um, you, I think, I think you're either you aren't allowed in a hospital or you are, maybe that's wrong. You're allowed in a hospital, but your medical costs are not covered uh, yeah. if you uh, are not vaccinated. Well, we'll see how that goes. I mean, that seems to be pretty, yeah, I mean, really sort of going against a Hippocratic oath in that right. sense. I, I don't, that is in a direction that I think we should be going. Um, 
know, there'll be some areas where there'll be some employer mandates or whatever, and I guess you could consider that to be a stick. Um, but generally, you'd like to be able to convince people that this is the right thing to do for them. Um, and you know, it'll it'll it's sort of just going to happen slowly, and there's going to be some diehards who will never get it. And, you know, they'll get infection-induced immunity, and they sort of roll their dice with that. Um, but I don't know that I'm really in favor of more draconian things like that that Singapore's doing. No, I do think that the mandates work because it's um, uh, it really removes um, it removes a level of uh, decision making, which is what people don't like. But kind of they just get it and they get it, you know. Then they're done. I know in New York, uh, you know, if if you're a if you're treated by an EMT, you're making an assumption that your emergency technician, who's all over you. Um, is vaccinated, and in many cases they weren't. Well, now I think it's 94% or something like that. Or at hospitals, uh, you know, you assume that the person who is caring for you, I mean, for their sake and for yours, is vaccinated. But until these mandates, which were 100% mandates for everyone who works in the hospital at every level, which is correct, because the people that are coming into the room and, and clearing the trash are just as important as, uh, uh, you know, as the nurses. They're just, they're all around you. So, you know, now we have 100% uh, at NICEF, uh, we, we mandated it, uh, you know, right away, everybody's uh, fully vaccinated. You can't even walk into NICEF if you're not fully vaccinated. And then people also wear masks, delightful. Um, but uh, I think, you know, I, I don't know, I remember last year uh, in a conversation, it was kind of, you know, when is this gonna be over? And it was April. And it, it, it kind of would have been April if it weren't for Delta, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, any advice to people who are, are going to be um, in, uh, you know, in kind of mixed company at, at holidays, upcoming holidays, you know, unvaccinated um, children, older people, you know, some people vaccinated, some people not. Well, I think we've gone over a lot of the options. There's a lot of ways in which you can protect yourself and some may be more palatable than others to people in your group. Um, you know, vaccination is the best. I mean, better than anything else, better than any of the other options that we have, vaccination is the best option. Um, but there are other things that you can sort of layer on um, if that's not, for whatever reason, um, viable. You know, you're, you have people who are just not going to get it in your family. Person. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, but as we talked about, there's there's tests or rapid tests. There's, I, I can't imagine that people are going to want to mask around each other, around their family indoors. But, you know, that's, yeah. I, I mean, you know, it's, theoretically possible, yeah, it's just um, that you know, way. and again, here, as you say, there's certain places where it's doable to do things outside, and right now in Arizona, it is. In July, it's not, um, so it's a little bit different than that. Front. So there's a lot of things that people can do. You sort of have to assess the individual situation and figure out the best way forward, but I think that if everyone's vaccinated in your group, um, you know, like there certainly are cases where people, you know, fully vaccinated people transmit to each other, um, but the likelihood of that happening is so much less than if you have an unvaccinated person in your group. So, um, yeah, I, again, I, as I can't emphasize this enough, this is the path back to normal. Um, and, you know, we're all tired of this. And, and, you know, the sooner we can get to that point, the better. Well, we'll, we'll let you rest uh, and recover from your booster. Thank you very much. I think, I think we can all agree that we're in much better shape now uh, than we were when we last spoke. Um, you know, I, I think go rapid test, use those rapid tests, you know, for holiday gatherings, you know, find them somehow uh, and, and use them. But thank you so much, Deepta, for, for, uh, for joining us today and, uh, um, and especially uh, under, the, uh, uh, under the influence of your, <laughs> of your business. Any, anytime, Susan, happy to help. All right, thanks so much. Okay, thank you.